Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. First of all, thank you very much for asking some amazing questions this week. If it's your first time watching the Q&A, please remember that I don't read these questions beforehand. Uh, what I do is I, uh, am asked, I look at them as I'm doing the Q&A, so you're getting a spontaneous answer. But if any of the questions I think could make a future video, uh, uh, I will do that. You know, I can take certain questions and make longer videos out of them. Also, please remember that you want to get your questions in ideally by a Wednesday. I typically film these things on a Wednesday. Um, so any questions that are asked after that, will you'll have to ask again because I will have missed them. This week, I'm answering the questions quite early. This is Tuesday morning. This is six o'clock. Why am I looking at a watch? I've just got a tattoo. This is six o'clock Tuesday morning. And the reason I'm answering them so quickly is this afternoon I'm on the way to Blackpool. I'm going to be at Blackpool for a couple of days before the convention starts doing some filming with Murphy's Magic. Um, so because of that, um, I'm, I'm answering the questions very early on this week. So if I do miss your question, I'm very sorry. I will get back to it next week. Uh, I would also like to say, if you're coming to Blackpool, uh, this is going out on the Sunday. So... When it goes out, I'll have been in Blackpool for a few days. This will be the final day of the convention. So if you watch this randomly in Blackpool and you're there and you haven't come up and said hello yet, please do so. That would be amazing. But without further ado, I've got all the questions here. Let's go straight into this week's Q&A. Okay, so the first question is by Jonah Berg, and Jonah says, what are your three favourite Michael Murray tricks? Great question. I could literally make a list a mile long, and I think I might have to at some point. But in terms of my three favourite Michael Murray tricks, I'd probably have to say in third place, it would be Sublime Influence 2.0. Now, Sublime Influence 2.0 is his Pepsi revelation. If you don't know what it is, uh, he has a prediction. He has a bunch of cards with different numbers on them. They mix the cards up. They can apparently take any of the five cards that they want to. They can shuffle them up, put them in any order. And yet when, they, um, uh, when, when they're put out into an order and lined up, you say that you've predicted it and you pull out the Pepsi logo. And it doesn't look like it makes any sense, but then when you turn the Pepsi logo over, it's got a surprise prediction that predicts the numbers they named. It's brilliant. It's absolutely awesome. Perfect to keep in your wallet. It's kind of like a little EDC thing. Uh, it's one of Michael's earlier tricks, but it's still very good. In second place, I would say Murray Mint. I'm a coin guy. I love coin magic. And for my money, Murray Mint is... One of the best coin tricks you can buy. It's also a kind of a bit of a weird thing for Michael to come up with, right? Because coin tricks, Michael's a mentalist. Having said that, he does do a lot of magic, and this is a perfect example. So Murray Men, think anniversary waltz, but with coins. You have a £2 coin, you have a 10p coin, they're both signed, and then amazingly, the signature jumps off the £2 coin and jumps onto the 10p coin, so that you end up with two signatures, one on each side, and the coin is given to the spectators. Keep as a souvenir. It's amazing. It is such a good trick. It really is. Uh, and it's the perfect trick for weddings. I've got some live performances of me doing Murray Mint on the, uh, on the channel. So you can go and look at that if you want to. And then finally, the number one Michael Murray trick, in my opinion, is The Solution, which came out as a little ebook, And it is, for my money, one of the best Rubik's Cube tricks you can do. It's a great finale to a Rubik's Cube routine. Uh, it uses a regular Rubik's Cube. And the idea is that you give the Rubik's Cube to the spectator and they solve it behind their back. That's right, you solve it behind They solve it themselves behind their back. First time I saw this, it was Stephen Brundwich doing it and did it on TV. And I had no idea how it worked. I was thinking special cubes, turning in a special way. I just couldn't work it out. When I finally got the solution and I read the method, I was blown away. It's really good. Like, it's really, really really good. I love the solution by Michael Murray. I really do. So they're my top three. I mean, I could, like I say, I can make a list a mile long. Uh, I do think that some of the stuff he's got coming out of Blackpool, however, is going to blow away anything else that he's brought out. So make sure you go and check his standout at the Blackpool Magic Convention. Okay, so the next question is by Sean Undertrack. And Sean says, question, we lost another great last week, Scott Alexander. I had the privilege to talk to Scott a few times 
and always thought he was a great person. I'd like to hear your thoughts on his career and his contributions to the magic community. Um, I am doing a longer video about this. At some point when I get back from Blackpool, I'm going to be doing a Scott Alexander tribute video on this channel. Scott meant a lot to me. Half of my act is made up of Scott Alexander routines. A lot of the routines that Ryland does in his show are by Scott Alexander. Uh, Ryland does Wishes 3.0. He does Velocity. He does uh, uh, the... Um, um, Scott's version of um, what's it called? Scott's version of the vanishing bandana with the the phone, the drinking, the shoe thing. But the third version with the Alexa, uh, shoe business, shoe business three. Uh, I do a bunch of Scott Alexander tricks, and and the perfect example is when um, I put uh, Matt's final act together for the matchumentary, uh, and I put together like a twenty five minute show for him to do on stage. We included, or I decided to include, two Scott Alexander tricks, uh, which shows what I think about Scott Alexander and his material. Uh, he's a, he was amazing. He was a legend. Uh, the magic community is really, really going to miss him. I think he was the greatest comedy magician in the world today. Uh, I, I think that a big hole uh, is now in the magic community, which I don't think anybody else is going to be able to fill. I mean, the amount of creativity. And oh, oh look. I'm doing a video on this. I don't want to talk about it too much now, but suffice to say, Scott Alexander was a genius. He was my favourite magician, and uh, I don't think I would have an act if it wasn't for Scott Alexander. Um, it's it's just a tragic loss. Okay, so the next question is from David. Mer uh, he posts a lot, but I can never remember his name. David Masano. David Masano. He's got three different uh, accounts, David Masano. Uh, let's read this one. Craig Petty is the biggest hypocrite in magic. He had the nerves to steal red, uh, to lie about the quantum deck being examinable, and after red, he does it again with ED seat. You're a sucker if you believe Craig Petty, the emperor has no clothes. Um, David's made over three accounts. Uh, David's all called David Messerino. Uh, David's made 37 posts on this channel. Um, every single one of them is about red and quantum deck. He's come back recently with uh, with ED seat and he's talking about ED seat as well. Um, I'm not going to give you any scream time, buddy. I don't know what you want me to say. Uh, I've talked about red extensively. Uh, I I I've talked about red extensively. Quantum deck I've covered extensively as well, and I think I've pretty much covered ED seat. If you don't like me, that's absolutely fine. Uh, not a problem. I'm sorry that you feel that way. I really do. But I'm not going to be able to change your mind. You've made it perfectly obvious, posting on this channel over and over again, that you don't like me, you don't like me as a human being, you don't like me as a person. And that's cool. That's great. That's your prerogative. Um, I'll just carry on doing what I'm doing. I'll carry on producing content on this channel for free to help people. That's what I'll carry on doing. I'll carry on... Uh, producing videos. I'll carry on putting out videos that so many people have said have helped them become better magicians or go out and perform or become full-time pros. I'll carry on doing that. I'll carry on releasing tricks that get five-star reviews all over the uh, all over the magic community that had led to me last year being Penguin Magic Creator of the Year and creating some of the best-selling tricks of 2022. I'll carry on doing that. I'll carry on producing content for the net tricks. Um, which has just blown away my expectations when it comes to where it is now versus where I thought it would be. I'll carry on doing that, okay? And you carry on doing your thing, which is really not liking me, but watching almost all of my videos and then commenting on them. Look, if I can give you one piece of advice, it's this. You obviously don't like me. That's fine. You obviously don't like the way that I do things. And that's fine. I've been told by many people I'm like Marmite. I've come to live with that. But here's the thing. I don't like cricket, so I don't watch it. I don't like Strictly Come Dancing, so I don't watch it. I don't like Call the Midwife. My lo wife loves it. I hate it, so I don't watch it. Not only do I not watch it, I don't think about it. I don't have an opinion on it. I don't go and online and comment about Call the Midwife or Cricket or 
strictly come dancing or any of that. I don't do any of that because it's a waste of my time to give my opinion on something I don't like. So here's my advice. You post on my channel all the time about how much I'm a thief and how much I'm a horrible person. And frankly, your opinion, I see another, I see another post about it from you and it's like water off a duck's back because it's one little voice in a noise of a hundred different people saying how much they respect my opinion. So I don't know what you're trying to achieve here. I don't know if you're trying to annoy me because you're not. I don't know if you're trying to piss me off because you're not. I don't know if you're trying to convince the entire world that I'm evil because if that's the case, you're not doing a very good job of it because Penguin Magic Creator of the Year, as voted for by the general public. So if your job is to convince people I'm not a very nice person, you're not doing a very good job because for every little post that you put on YouTube, I'm putting seven videos out which are designed to help people. So ultimately what we have here is you have a situation where you're not happy and you're upset and yet you're constantly watching my videos in order to comment, which is going to make you even more annoyed. It's going to make you even more obsessed. It's now bordering on obsession. I get it. You don't like me. You don't have to keep shouting at it from the rooftops that you don't like me. Here's the thing. I remember watching Ricky Gervais in stand-up once. And Ricky Gervais uh, was talking about Twitter. And he said, uh, people having opinions about posts on Twitter is a little bit like having... Um, an advert on a, on a lamppost uh, that says, hey, guitar lessons, here's the number. And taking your phone and ringing up the number and going, I don't want guitar lessons. This is the situation we have with you, dude. You don't like me. You don't like my products. That's cool. Don't buy them and don't watch me. That's simple, right? Don't buy them. Don't watch me. Spend some time doing something that's more productive for you. Because then, if you did that, you might be in a situation where you're actually contributing positively to the community, as opposed to just being a toxic, just toxic posts everywhere, right? I'm fairly sure that if we met in person, you'd quite like me and we'd have a drink together. But I think you've got this hang up, I think you're obsessed about me, it's coming off a bit like a bit of a stalkerish vibe, okay? So if I were you, I'd chill. Because for every post you put out, it's not doing what it's meant to do. It's not upsetting me, dude. So look, you've got two ways that you can go with this. You can carry on posting your little comments and wasting your time. You took time to watch this video. You took time to post that. You've posted it just on six videos today, not just a and a Dude, do something else with your life. You've only got one short life on this planet. Don't waste it by being all negative about something you don't like. If you don't like something or you don't like somebody, don't watch it. Don't watch Magic TV. Don't buy my product. And I get it. I get it. I'm everywhere. Oh, I can't get away from Craig Petty because he's everywhere. Do you know why I'm everywhere? Because I work really hard to be everywhere. But you can still avoid me. You can still ignore me. And if I were you, I'd do that. Because like I say, right now, it's getting a bit stalkerish. It's getting a bit creepy. You know, you're coming across a bit of a creepy vibe. Um, if I were you, I'd just focus on something more positive. That's what I'm doing. I, I, I answered your question because it popped up in the Q&A. But I don't give you a second thought. I don't even think about you. These comments, I just see them. Half the time my team delete them for me. I don't even care. But the times that I do see them, I don't think about them. I go, oh, there he is again. Yep, still doesn't like me. Move on. You're wasting your time. So the next question is from Agent Suter. And Agent says, hi, Craig. I'm looking for a good trick to liven up a lengthy lecture. The lecture is not magic related. The trick should help set a relaxed mood. It should play well for an audience of 100 people or more. Pack small and light because of limited space in the suitcase and need as little setup as possible. Any ideas? 
Yeah, I've got the perfect one. I would, if I were you, go for uh, Down to One by John Allen. Now, if you don't know what Down to One is, you come out with an envelope, you give the envelope to somebody, or you hang it up, or you put it in full view. You then say that you're going to play a game of heads or tails. And the idea is that you bring out a red and black poker chip uh, that's custom designed and included in the package. And uh, you're going to get somebody on stage with you, and you flick the poker chip. And uh, as it's in the air, they call red or black. And then the idea is the people in the audience have to put their hands on their head or their hands on their uh, arse. And, and the idea is if you, if you call black, for example, um, you know, and it is black, everyone sits down. The, the idea is that you're eliminating people randomly through the use of a tossing of a coin, or in this case, a poker chip. And you're left with one person at the end, and uh, uh, that one person that's left uh, wins the whole thing. But then you open up the prediction, and once you open up the prediction, the prediction actually... Um, points out everything. So it points out who the, who, the, uh, who the person is that would win, describes them perfectly. You can even say the seat number they're in or where they're sitting. It's great. Um, it involves the whole audience, so it's really interactive, it, like you wanted. It's very relaxed. Uh, it's very fun. Um, and in terms of props, it's a little poker chippy thing and a clipboard and an envelope. And the setup is very minimal. You literally write the prediction out five minutes before you walk on stage. So I would go for Down to One by John Allen. There are other versions of it as well, like Flip, uh, which came out as a download through Penguin Magic. There's a bunch of different stuff, but uh, John Allen's got the complete kit. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'd do. I'd go with that routine because I think with what you're trying to achieve there, that routine would be absolutely perfect. So hopefully that helps, Adrian. Is Nathan uh, Elba. And Nathan Elba says, Hi, Craig. Hi, Nathan. I was wondering which full shuffle you use. Does it depend at all on the circumstances? Uh, which full shuffle you use the most? Uh, does it depend on circumstances? Yeah, if I'm using a small packet of cards, like maybe less than 26 cards, a lot of the time I'll do a Charlie A shuffle. Uh, because that, for me, feels like a really good shuffle to use. Um, uh, the Charlier shuffle works really well for small packets. If I'm doing something like trivia, for example, uh, then I'll be using the Charlier shuffle. If I'm doing a full deck full shuffle, it's normally a grey shuffle or a truffle shuffle, which is the false waterfall shuffle. That, for me, is the best full shuffle ever. Uh, and if I really want to try and show people that I've shuffled the deck and I haven't, it's normally the, that false waterfall shuffle that I tend to go for. I tend not to go for Zaro shuffles or push-through shuffles, just because I'm not really sitting at a table ever. Um, I do have a really nice false uh, uh, Faro shuffle which I taught on um, Forecast by the 1914, which I'll also throw in as well. Uh, the situations occasionally where that would actually be more appropriate than the, uh, the False Waterfall Shuffle, but they're the ones that I tend to go for. If I'm trying to create more of a relaxed vibe, uh, you know, like let's say it's hardcore mentalism or something like that, uh, I'd, I'd typically do a False Overhand Shuffle. Uh, where and again I taught this on the Netrix, the false overhand shuffle. It is where you kind of give the deck a full shuffle and you're really cutting it into three sections. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's the. That, but really, more often than not, if I'm using a deck of cards, it's going to be is it the truffle shuffle or the grey shuffle? That that one of those sort of false uh, waterfall shuffles are the ones that I tend to go for. Okay, so the next question is from Seth Howard, and Seth Howard says, Great video as always. Thank you, man. Appreciate what you do. When performing to music, do you think it's more important to choreograph your moves to the music or have the emotion of the music match the emotion you're trying to convey with the magic? I think both is very important. Uh, I think it's really important to get the right piece of music and really what you're trying to communicate to the audience will fit that. And as I say, in my illusion show, I use a lot of music, but when I'm in my cabaret show, don't really use too much music at all. Ryland, however, his show is made up predominantly of music, depending on the show that he's doing. And the music that we pick is very much based on what he's trying to put across at the time. Um, and I think that choreography is important as well. So, um, and uh, it, it, what was the question? Choreograph the moves to the music, yeah. If you go back and watch Ryland's um, BGT audition, when he was doing uh, Rubik's Wall, and he was tapping the kids on the shoulders, and there were 16 kids, and he was tapping them on the shoulders, and they were taking the cubes up to the, uh, up to the wall. He must have spent about six months rehearsing that, because the beats, when he was tapping them on the shoulder, had to fit to the beat of the music. 
and at the time he'd never really performed to music before so this was a really new experience for him so he was just like practicing that for like six months running around in a car park in the, in the car park at the office uh, we'd set up like loads of different objects to be the kids and he was just there tapping things on the shoulders and running around it was uh, a long process but it's the same it's the same whenever you know you have to choreograph your beats if you look at Ryland's um, dancing cane routine uh, he uses the music from The Witcher for the dancing cane routine and he uses a light up cane that lights up blue and then lights up red. He starts off with a normal cane, then it turns blue, then it turns red. You'll notice that when the cane changes colour, it's fitting the beat in the audience. It's fitting the beat in the, uh, in the, um, in the, in the song. And uh, you know, yeah, we spend a long time thinking about that. So choreography is very important, but I think it's equally as important that, that the the track that you're using matches the, the the routine in terms of what you're trying to achieve with that routine. Imagine if you were doing a very somber, very serious piece, and then the music playing in the background was da, 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 you know, it just it just wouldn't fit. So getting the right piece of music is important, but I think the choreography is equally as important. Okay, so the next question is from Curtis Wines, and Curtis says, Hey Craig, really been enjoying the different series of your channel. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, the question is, I may be performing for kids' parties this year. Good, good choice. You mentioned you do a linking rings at kids' shows. I'm learning the linking rings routine right now. What's your approach with the performance style for kids? Well, for kids' shows, I do the Pop Hayden linking ring routine because uh, there's a lot of audience interaction and I can have a kid come up on stage and help me. Now, if you don't know what the Pop Hayden linking ring routine is, the idea is that you bring somebody with you on stage who's standing there. Now, I've changed it around slightly, because Pop halfway through sends them back to their seat, but I keep them on stage the entire time. Uh, and I make this my birthday kid trick. So this is the trick that the birthday kid does, because it makes them look like the star of the show. And my hook line to get into it is, hey, I need someone to come up and be the star of the show. They're going to do the trick themselves, and I can't think of anybody better to do this than blah. So I bring the birthday kid up, and, uh, and when the birthday kids come up, um... Yeah, when the birthday kids come up, I go into the Pop Hayden routine. Now, what makes this better than a normal linking ring routine, especially for kids shows, is there's a big emphasis on look no see. Uh, go, if you don't know what look no see is, it is, for my, in my opinion, the single most important thing about running a kid's party. It's the concept of something happening when the, spe when the magician isn't noticing. So, for example, it might be in the Silver Scepter, for example, the scepter is rising up in the air and you haven't noticed that uh, because you're looking at the audience. And when you look at it and you see it and you react, it's a very funny moment, right? Look, no, see is really important. Now, with Pop Hayden's routine, you start by linking the rings together and then uh, the spectator links two of the rings, you link two of the rings, so they look like a star right from the very beginning, but then you've got this really funny moment where you're telling them to unlink the rings and you're showing them how to unlink the rings and you're doing it and they're standing next to you and they're not able to do it, but you're not noticing, and then you're linking the rings again and when the links are ringed, you look back and they see, you see their rings are linked and you go, yeah, give me a high five, that's brilliant, you're doing a great job. And, and that happens quite a few times until you realise that they're not doing it, at which point they help you then do the rest of the routine, or at least the way I do it, they do. Um, it's a killer, killer premise, and it's, it's just genius by Doc. As I say, the only thing I added to it is I keep the spectator on stage the whole time. So they help me link the three rings together, then the four rings together, and they help me unlink the rings as well. And the last two rings are unlinked by them. Uh, which is really cool because that's kind of the applause point. And uh, it, at the end, they're there holding the rings like this. I'm holding my rings like this. They're all separate. And it's a really great moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I would look into the Pop Hayden linking ring routine. You can get it as a download from Penguin Magic. You might want to adapt it a little bit yourself. But the majority, that is the best linking ring routine for a kid show performer, 100%. But the one piece of advice I give you, you say that you're starting doing kids shows. My advice would be play the performance as if it's a family audience. So I know the kids are there, but there's going to be adults there as well. Impress the adults. OK, don't just do the show or the trick to the kids. Do it to the adults as well. 
that's really important because ultimately they're the ones going to be booking you in the future. You impress them and they're more likely to book you. So play the show to the adults as well as the kids. Focus on the kids for sure, but try and bring the adults into it as well. Okay, the next question is from Daniel Carter. And Daniel says, hey, Craig, where can I buy your project locked in a room without coins? I would prefer if I could get it as a download, but a DVD is fine too. I don't think it's available as a download anywhere. I also don't think that, uh, well, Magic Shop have any. I'm just going through my stock because when I left the Magic community, I had a few locked in a room without coins and uh, they just got put to one side. And I, I still have some. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Magic TV is setting up a shop. We're gonna have a, a shop of my products. And in there, uh, we're gonna list everything. Now, I think, as I say, I have a few locked in a room without coins. Um, so we're gonna be putting those on the shop when the shop is live. But uh, if you really, 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 really want one, Email admin at thenetrix.com. So that's admin, A-D-M-I-N, at thenetrix, T-H-E-N-E-T-R-I-X.com and say to them, hey, I want a copy of Locked in the Room Without Coins and I'm sure they can sort that out for you. That's my team that you'll be able to do that. So speak to them. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think you can get it as a download. Pretty sure you can't. I don't think you can get it as a, um, uh, as a DVD from World Magic Shop anymore. It's definitely not on their site but I do have a few in the warehouse that I've found. Okay, so the next question is from Steve Black, and Steve says, hey, Craig, could you tell me what you think of the propless mentalism, and do you think you need a certain type of personality in order to be successful? Um, I'm not a big fan. The caveat to this is I've seen Pete Turner do propless mentalism, and he does it brilliantly. The problem is I think other mentalists watch Pete do it, and they think that they can do it as well as Pete. And I have seen so many mentalists who are awesome, by the way, try to do propless mentalism. And it just comes across as boring at best. And at worst, you're just guessing. Um, I, I, Pete's really the only person that I've seen pull off propless mentalism to any degree of success. Uh, very few people are able to pull it off. Uh, as well as Pete. Uh, no, I lie. Michael Murray, I've seen do some really cool propless mentalism stuff as well, where he's just getting me to think of cards and he's telling me what cards that I'm thinking of. Um, but most people don't pull it off very well. My attitude towards propless mentalism is I'm, and, and this comes from the fact that I'm not a mentalist, I'm a magician. Um, I prefer the, the, the type of mentalism that does require props. Uh, I, I especially love mentalism where not only does it require props, but it requires lots of props. Like I love, um, I, I really, really love the, um, um, what am I gonna call it? I'm going mad. I really love like Chris Cox and he's got like a stage full of stuff. I love that sort of uh, presentation of it, I really do. But, uh, and the reason is very simple, right? I believe that we owe it to our audience to do the best possible performance that we can do. Uh, we owe that to our audience, right? If they're booking us or they're coming and watching us, we need to do the best possible performance that we can do. So in other words, why would I not want to use props? There's no way that propless mentalism is going to beat a Mindbuster Pro from Labco, for example. There's no way it can. How could it possibly? Um, you know, hey, write something down, anything. You hold on to it. You're thinking of this. Like, there's no way. There's certain things that propless mentalism just isn't going to improve. Um, so because of that, I would much rather use props. I don't believe in the whole minimalist approach and the mentalist wouldn't have this, the mentalist wouldn't have that. I, I, I don't believe in that approach. But again, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a mentalist. I don't know. However, I do think that, uh, that yeah, prop, propless mentalism a lot of the time can come across as guessing. Like, it just looks like you're just guessing. Um, right time, right place is great. I think it's more of an impromptu thing. I think it's more of a social thing. I think propless mentalism works best when you're out and about and you've got nothing on you. Uh, it's like the mentalist's equivalent of impromptu magic. You know, a magician might go, oh, I've got nothing on me. Lend me a coin, I'll show you a trick. Mentalist goes, I've got nothing on me. Let me go propless. I, I think it might be. But I think that uh, if mentalists are going to try and do propless mentalism, understand that it's probably not as clever as you think it is. And study 
especially Pete Turner, but also Michael Murray, because those are two gentlemen that actually have been able to figure out a way of getting it right. Okay, so the next question is from Fahim Kazimi, uh, Kaz Kazmi, uh, I think, sorry uh, about mispronouncing your name, and says, hey Craig, loving your videos, keep them coming. My question for your next video is if you could make a video on what goes into preparing for a gig. Things that are not related to magic, for example, staying hydrated, how early to arrive at the venue, and specific preparation when you, uh, when you move from city to city. Fantastic question. Absolutely 100% not answering it now because I think that would make a brilliant video. So when I get back from Blackpool, I'll get onto that. I've never thought about doing a video like that before, but that's awesome. So yes, my friend, that is a video that's going to be coming soon. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay, so the next question is from the Magic and Mentalism Library. And they say, hi, Craig, do you have any idea where to purchase a version of the Salt Pour? Yes. Um, Levents, uh, I actually use the salt pour in my act and I actually use Levents version of the salt pour and I actually have his little uh, salt cellar for it as well, it's brilliant. Uh, Levents, uh, where would you get Levents salt pour from? Uh, one minute, put L-E-V-E-N-T, salt, Levents, salt, pour. Levents salt pour, let's have a look. Oh, there's a few places you can get it, there you go but it looks to me like the best place to get it is Levent's website, leventmagic.com, L-E-V-E-N-T, magic, M-A-G-I-C.com. Let me just check to see if it's for sale. Uh, magic products for sale, there's a little button at the top. Uh, let's have a look here. Let's have a look, here we go. Levent's, uh, half dyed silk, there we go, boom. Levent's salt pour gimmick. Limited quantities of the salt pour gimmick are on sale below, so they are in stock. Uh, this is the best salt pour gimmick in, ever made. It's the real work, I agree with that. Uh, including a downloadable instructional video, full explanation of event stage routine for the long salt pour. Um, yep, it's there. That's what I would suggest you get. And um, yeah, it comes with... Oh, they've got a uh, very limited quantities. Uh, they have the ultimate salt pour set, which is what I've got, which includes the gimmick and shake holder. Um, so this is for the case, so you can steal it out quickly. The silk holder, because this routine uses a silk, 24-inch uh, white silk, gimmick salt shaker, modified plastic gimmick, instructional download video. There we go. So you've got all of that. So I'd go for the salt pour gimmick. Uh, the salt pour gimmick on its own is $40 according to his website. It's $100 for the, for the full set. Uh, if that's a little bit rich for your blood, the other option is on one of the Penguin Christmas uh, Scott Alexander Dan Harlan episodes from a few years ago, Scott did his version of the salt pour to open up the Christmas special. And he taught you how to make a salt pour gimmick for pence, um, which was genius at the time. I remember looking at it and thinking, if I don't, if I didn't have the vents, I would absolutely use this. And you get to see Scott Alexander do his salt pour routine and the music that he uses for it is brilliant. Because that's another thing Scott was great at, musicality. So there you go, there's a couple of different reference points for the salt pour. I'd go for the vents, but you can go check out Scott's version as well. He's got a version you can ha make at home for just a few pence or a few cents. Okay, so the next question is from Matthew Her, uh, Henley, Hen, Hen, Henley, and Matthew says, Hi Craig, do you know where the Destination Box by John Allen is in stock? It's, uh, do you know where the Destination Box by John Allen is in stock? If not, is there similar boxes you'd recommend? I recommend the Destination Box. Uh, every single time I recommend the Destination Box, I think it's the best box. Now, I spoke to John Allen uh, about this in fact i've got an interview coming up with him on the channel um i've got an interview with him coming up on the channel and we talk about uh, i can't find his website hang on john allen magic shop Let's see if that's it got it okay so um yeah so i've got an interview coming up with him as one of the videos that's going up before blackpool where i'm speaking to the dealers john is one of the people that i spoke to and he said that he's taking three or four destination boxes to the Blackpool Magic Convention. He was really frustrated because he'd ordered more 
and they're coming in the week after Blackpool. And he said he was having 20 or 30 come in, but not coming in until the week after Blackpool. So he's going to put them onto his site. So in other words, if you go onto John Allen's website, which by the way is onlinemagicshop.co.uk, if you go onto there, you will find the destination box in there somewhere because it's a John Allen routine. Only John Allen has it and nobody else. So go look on there. You'll find the destination box on there. If it says it's out of stock, it's going to come back into stock about a week or two after Blackpool. So keep an eye on, on it because I know he's got more coming in. But you can you can hear it from him himself if you watch the video that I've got coming up. Or by the time you watch this, it will have gone live. So go and look at the video that I did, the interview I did with John Allen. And he talks about the destination box and shows it as well. Okay, so the next question is from Matthew Henley, and Matthew says, Hi Craig, I'm wondering how to structure an act and putting together a stage show, such as trick selection, transitioning from one routine to the other, and everything else. Is there a video up on the channel about this? And do you have any downloads, DVDs, or books on this to recommend? Thank you so much. So first of all, I have kind of got a video on this. I've got a video called How to Run an Awesome Parlour Show. If you put that into YouTube, How to Run an Awesome Parlour Show, uh, Magic TV, uh, Craig Petty, something like that, it'll come up. It's a very long video. It's about an hour and 40 minutes long. It's live performance footage of my parlor show and then breaks down every trick I do, why I did it, how I transitioned from one trick to the other. I talk about hook lines, I talk about transitions, and I talk about routining the show. So that's a video that you can watch. That'll probably be a useful video for you to go and see. Uh, I have got a ton of content on this subject going up on the Netflix soon. So if you go onto the Netflix, uh, there's a ton of content going up there um, that's uh, all uh, about creating a stage show, creating a close-up show. Uh, that's going to be dropping at some point in February once I've come back from Blackpool. Me and Jack are about halfway through filming this, and that's going to go up on um, uh, on the silver level of the Netflix. It's going to be a ton of advice on show structure and everything. So, yeah, that's, that's coming, so keep an eye out for that. But uh, in terms of... Um, in terms of any other downloads, I don't know of anything. Somebody's commented, let's have a look. Oh, this is a good shout. Michael Lawrence says, Stage by Stage by John Graham, which is a book that came out recently from Vanishing Inc. Highly recommended, covers the exact topics you're interested in. Absolutely. And while we're on the subject, actually, something else has popped into my head. You can get a download from 1914 by Alexander Marsh, and it's called The Art of Stagecraft. And it's basically a full on like three or four hour uh, download on how to perform on stage. And a lot of the stuff that you're asking is on there as well. So there you go. John Graham's book, the download for the 1914, how to run an awesome parlor show, which is on YouTube for free and the metrics at silver level as of sort of March. So there are your sources. Hope that helps. Okay, so the next question is from Pratik Kohli, uh, and he says, uh, great Q&A as always. I've pre-ordered EDC, waiting for it to ship. I have a few questions. Number one, what justification can one give for using American receipts for EDCs in other countries as I live in India? Um, well, first of all, there's a few different ways that you can actually customise the receipts to your local country. You don't need to just use the receipts that we provide. So first of all, when you order EDC, you get the files. So if you're decent at using computers, you can actually change those files around and you can make receipts for your own country. No problem. Second of all, Pete Turner talks about how you can actually create EDC receipts using stores that are local to you which is a fantastic thing. So watch the two hour tutorial with Pete, he talks about that. Three, there's many places online that you can actually get fake receipts made, like many, many places. If you just type in fake receipts into Google, I bet you something will come up right now. Boom, customize, there you go, makereceipt.com. Make a receipt in seconds, restaurant, travel, sales, rent and taxi. Trusted by thousands of people in 84 countries. They've got templates on there. You just literally select a template. You can create the receipt. Once you know how EDC works, you can create a receipt. You can even insert your own logo into there if you want to. And you can create your own receipts. Makereceipt.com is where you want to go. That way you can use all, you can, you can make your own receipts, okay? So that's another option 
But in terms of how to justify the receipts themselves, you could just say, hey, um, you know, you've you traveled to America and you came back and you've still got some receipts in your wallet. Or you could say, hey, um, you know, I want to try something. If I had you think of something, uh, I might influence you. So we're going to try and do something. I've got some of the receipts here. Now, a friend in America sent them over to me. I asked him to take some receipts from random places and just send them over to me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've got them here. I'm going to use them. I'm going to show you something. There's a lot of different ways to um, justify it and I actually talk about that on the project as well. But if you're worried about any of that, then just go and, uh, you, you know, just go and make your own receipts. It's fairly easy to do. You have got a second point to this. How is EDC different from Paul Fowler's transaction as both predicted items from receipts? The methods are completely different in every way, shape and form. Um, Paul's is a great routine. Mine is a great routine. They're both great. In fact, me and Paul have been talking and there are ways of actually incorporating both routines into one. If you have transaction and EDC, you can take a bunch of receipts out, put some to one side, do transaction and then say actually just try something else and do EDC and there's ways of actually combining those tricks together so EDC and transaction actually work really well together because the methods are completely different okay we've got one more question from Pratik Kohli and Pratik says uh, I already have an Orphic wallet it's a great peak can you please tell me if investing is in the Shelby wallet by Mark Mason whose sneak peek was given on your Talk Magic dealer special worth it um, I suppose it just depends on what you're looking for. I loved the Shelby wallet. I'm going to be checking it out at Blackpool. There's a very good chance I'll buy one because I do love Mark's material and it looked really good in the talk, in the sneak peek. Um, so I'll probably get one, but really it just depends on you. I mean, the Orphic wallet for me, one of the advantages of the Orphic wallet is it's also a switching device and it's also a card to wallet. It's my everyday wallet, but it's also the wallet that I use to do card to wallet with when I'm at a gig. It's also the wallet that I use when I'm switching stuff, which is, it's it's got so many uses. I, 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 and I don't use peaks that often in the real world. Uh, when I'm gigging, I don't really do peaking that often. Occasionally I will, but I don't think I'd carry a wallet around just to peak something when I've got the Orphic wallet that I can use to peak something, but it's also my card to wallet. So I think it's gonna to have to be incredible for it to actually replace the Orphic wallet as my everyday carry or my gigging wallet. But that's not to say it's not very good. It is very, very good and I probably will get it, but I just can't see how it's gonna replace what I've got at the moment because what I've got at the moment is perfect for me. Now, if you were a mentalist and you wanted the ultimate peak, there's a very good chance that Shelby wallet might fit that. Um, and, and if I've got a peak wallet and I want another peak wallet, the Shelby wallet very possibly is the way to go with that. But I won't know until I've seen it. I just know what it looks like on camera and on camera it looks amazing. Um, but I don't think it will replace the wallet I need. Okay, so the next question is from Divi Rayo. And Divi says, what should you do if someone asks you to do a levitation when you're not prepared? For example, loops. Okay, so it, uh, I'm going to assume this means that maybe you've done something with loops on them and they've asked you to do something else. And you're kind of like, oh, God you know how am I going to do this there's two ways to deal with it the first way is to deflect so the first way is to say well you know I can't I, I'm, I'm going to do something I, I, rather than making something float or levitate I'm going to see if I can make something move with the power of my mind because that's a lot harder that's a lot more difficult and then I go into Jackie Yu's impromptu uh, haunted deck because Jackie uses Impromptu Haunting Deck, just uses a regular deck of cards. I can go into it anytime, anywhere, but it really gives the impression that things are moving with the power of my mind. So I'd probably say, well, yeah, I can, let, I can, I can make something float, absolutely, but it's way harder to make something move with the power of my mind. So I'd kind of go down that route. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the one route I'd do. Or the other route, if I, I and again, Actually, yeah, that, that's probably the way that I'd do it. But I, I'd go one of two ways. I'd either you use Jackie Yu's Impromptu Haunted Deck, which is great. Or the other way I'd do it, miss, myself and David Penn put out a DVD many, many years ago. And it was called Dave and Craig Hit the Road. And it was when we went to Las Vegas to Magic Live. And we videoed the whole thing. And we got lots of contributions from other magicians. But one thing that Dave did is he taught how to do a really cool moving straw. You just take a straw. Um, and you take a bottle, you put the straw on the bottle, and then you just move it and it spins around like this and it looks absolutely amazing. Uh, he also teaches how to make a beer bottle, um, sort of, or not levitate, but stick to your hand, 
uh, like impossibly, which looks really good as well. Um, both of those techniques would fit the criteria to what you're looking for because it would feel like you're doing a levitation or an animation and you're not. So have a look into Jackie Yu's Haunted Deck, uh, Impromptu Haunted Deck. You can get that, you can get that from um, um, Penguin Magic as a download and see if you can find a copy of Hit the Road by Dave and Craig because there's a couple of really cool bits on there as well. Okay, uh, another question from Divi or AU, and Divi says, have you ever tried making multiple cards or fans appear out of thin air? No, you know what? I was never into card manipulation. It's not something I've ever wanted to do. It's not something I've ever had any interest in. I'd learned how to do a back palm, but I was never a card manipulation guy. It was never something that floated my uh, boat, so to speak. Now, Ryland, on the other hand, he's so into manipulation. He's always, um, you know, he's learning card manipulation at the moment. His favorite DVDs currently are the Jeff McBride DVDs. So he's he's learning split fans and just pop out things. So he's doing all of that. Not me, no, but Ryland, yes. So there you go. It's just not something I was interested in. Okay, so the next question is from Sticky. And Sticky says, hi, Craig. I was wondering if you have any tips for quietly nesting a shell. Wondering if you have any tips for quietly nesting a shell. The biggest piece of advice I would give you is to just practice. Uh, and understand where you're wanting to nest the coin into the shell from. Is the shell in finger palm? Is the shell in classic palm? Is the coin out? Or have you got the coin here and you've got the shell at the tips of the fingers? There's lots of different ways that you can actually have the shell and the coin in different places. And that will affect how the shell is getting nested onto the coin and so on and so forth. The biggest piece of advice I can give you beyond practicing is just to have a very soft, light touch. It's that soft, light touch that will make it work. Don't be ham-fisted with it. Try to make it very light touch. That's what's going to make it work. Okay, so the next question is from Dave Boz Bozarth. And Dave says, uh, do you know if the gaff deck you and Lloyd are working on will be with cohort decks? No, it's not going to be with cohorts. It's going to be, I believe, it's, it's one of the bicycle style back designs. I'm not too sure. That's Lloyd's department. Um, I can't remember which one. I want to say maiden back, but I can't remember. But it's one of the bicycle star back designs. So uh, yeah, that's that's what that's what it's getting made from. So there you go, guys. That is another uh, Q&A in the bag. Once again, thank you so much for joining me here on Magic TV. And thank you so much for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. It's been a tough couple of weeks this last two weeks. And the support and the messages that you guys have sent over to me means the world. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate it. Don't forget, you want to see more videos like this, you're just going to like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment down below. You want to go join the Netflix? you can do so. It's just going to www.thenetrix.com. That's www.thenetrix.com. I'll be back again this evening with another uh, video. This one's going to be a review show special, so make sure you check that out. And I will be back again next week with a bunch more videos. But once again, thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you again soon. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.